So, Paul. What's up? Normally, I start off the show by telling you about something, but I'm not going to do that because the thing I would tell be telling you about is a thing that you're going to be doing, and the fiction of me explaining something to you would be ruined by that. So You couldn't do it even for the audience? You couldn't maintain that illusion? I have no idea how it... So, Paul, I had an idea this week that you would do a bunch of work. What do you think of that? Whoa, wow. No, no, that, no that, that Paul Spooner would do a bunch of work, right? Make him a third right. party. Right. So, the, so what we're talking about, and the plans are not final. We were just batting this around a few minutes before starting the show. But we're thinking of uploading the podcast to YouTube. Yeah. I, it should be pretty straightforward, and people keep asking for it in the comments. So, uh, I was, and you didn't want to pollute your site feed whatever channel i guess with uh with a podcast when you're trying to do you know video targeted content and so i was just going to put it up on my channel because it's already polluted with all kinds of garbage <laughs> i don't know that i would use the word pollution for any of that but yeah you've, you've got the idea all right let's not talk about this too much because i don't want someone on youtube to click on this video that's entirely talking about the video being on youtube because that's the <laughs> most boring thing in the world it's so meta so, though so let's talk about the youtube algorithm no i'm kidding let's talk about satisfactory the update dropped this week yes update number three tell me what you think of it because i, I don't want to comment until i want to go second okay i have uh i've really enjoyed satisfactory it doesn't help that or it doesn't hurt i guess it doesn't hurt that i've been off work this past week I, i'm taking some time off because we have a new baby um yeah so baby. i've been home a lot and so i played something like 30 hours of satisfactory 40 hours of satisfactory in the past week uh playing with a new update and it's it's a good time so the first thing i did when i got the update was i loaded up one of my old games. Normally when there's an update, I start over. So I see everything. But the first thing I did right. was upload was jumped into an old game and jumped into the truck and found they still haven't fixed the stupid bug where the controls are backwards in the truck. Oh my oh, goodness. No. I'm, you know, the first time I was like, haha, that's a silly mistake to make. What a goofy oversight. I'm sure they'll get it in update number one. No. Update number two. Okay, this is getting silly. So here we are in update number three, and I'm genuinely annoyed. Like, you know, you're come probably on. the only person in the universe who actually cares about why invert mouse controls in the truck. Uh, I know there are a few dozen. The problem is we haven't all, like, somebody will open a thread, it'll get four replies, and meanwhile somebody's saying, hey, I think this game should have pipes, you know, fluid pipes, and there's like 400 replies to that. And then one guy going, yeah, you know, the yeah. controls in the truck are backwards if you use inverted mouse, and he gets four replies, yeah, this is so annoying, dude, oh, that's terrible. And then a few weeks later, another person posts and they get three replies. And so, yeah, it just can't be a high priority for him. Right, but it's such a tiny change. It's two lines of code. Come on, give me access to the, give me access to the yeah, code. Yeah, it seems like I'll it do it for be you. that hard. It's super, I mean, I've worked on many, many, many projects and it's, that sort of thing has never been more than two lines of code. Check for the user's settings. Oh, the settings are inverted. Then multiply the the y value by negative one, and you're done. Two lines of code yeah. fixed. This this doesn't require a bunch of Q and A or a bunch of messing around, and it's it's a real quality of life issue that drives me crazy. I mean, it's it's uncomfortable using invert but controls that are backwards to you. But it's worse when the controls are backwards sometimes and it switches back and forth as you're trying to play. Yeah. Oh, it's like a trap then. Yes. And then you then it'll screw you up. I'll, I'll like close satisfactory, go to play some other game and I'll be go like my hands won't know what I'm doing and I'll be going backwards, you know, doing the wrong thing because <laughs> no. I've been all confused. So it's like unwiring my brain by playing this like I limit 
the amount of time, like I try and get the camera nice and level and then don't move it at all. And then I have to go up a hill and then I end up just looking at the roof of the truck. <laughs> I'm like, but I don't want to move the mouse. It'll just confuse me. <sighs> so it's, it's really, it's really annoying. And I'm now I'm angry and my feelings are hurt and I'm feeling neglected. Make this right oh, satisfactory. Man. You're not gonna, you're not gonna take this as a, the impetuous to finally retrain yourself to, to wife lip. After 30 years of muscle mem of collective muscle memory, there's no way yeah. I'd undo it. Uh, yeah. there's no After way. 30 years, finally, you can be free. Ugh, th I mean, that would take months. And that would be months of, like, being terrible and uncomfortable at video games. We'd get to the end of the year reviews, and I'd be like, 2020 had nothing but terrible games, and they were all super hard. <laughs> Everybody's like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> You suddenly forget how you to play. play. Some, you know, platformers and you know, kind of refresh yourself. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we're actually going to talk about this later in the show. Okay. But, but yeah, and I haven't gotten to any of the new stuff in Satisfactory. I've oh, just been man, because uh, I start over. So, and so hang on. Still so, in the early. Oh, game. so you did start over? Did you start over or not? I did. It, well, I loaded okay. it up. Saw the mouse was still screwed up but then i like you know started a fresh new game i almost i almost started in the new starting area where you're out in the desert yeah that's what i did i i started a brand new game uh out in the desert and built up from scratch i'm i'm really close to the end game now i'm setting up my my uh aluminum factory but the description the makes it are really fun yeah they look cool the the description made it sound like you know there's a trade-off on all the starting areas it's like you have nice open space for building but it's a huge distance to get to the different resources so you have to build this immense base and lots of transport sure. or, or, or you have lots of foliage so you have lots of fuel early game but then you got to clear stuff out all the time Right, and the places where the resources are closer together have rocks in the way, and you're like kind of cramming your base into valleys and stuff. So that's a trade-off. And it, the description of the new area made it sound like it was the worst of all worlds. Like, everything's far, far apart, and, it's, and I was like, wait, wait, that doesn't sound very fun. Uh, I found so I that it's out. pretty close to most of the... It's not like on top of any of the end game resources but it's pretty close to most of the end game resources so it's kind of like it's like an, an end game focused area i think where it's a little harder at the beginning but by the time you get to the end it's like oh well i only have to make this you know real short railway to here to get the oil and real short way away here to get the coal and that kind of stuff huh and now i'm feeling regret well yeah you know. well we'll see We'll yeah. see. I, the uh, the thing I like the most about the changes they made, I mean, they added pipes, obviously. Um, the thing I like the most, though, is the refinery, because the refinery has coupled inputs and outputs. So, like, it takes two different inputs, but it takes one fluid and one uh, solid, one, like, conveyor input. And then it outputs right. almost almost all of the, the primary processes output the primary thing you're trying to make plus a side product. So like if you're creating plastic, it'll output um, a heavy petroleum fluid. And then you have to do something with that. You have to make another refinery to refine that into something useful. And so it's kind of cool where it's like, okay, I got to make this big plant, but then I also have to make this separate plant to process all the side products. Interesting. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Oh, yeah, another thing they have is accelerated start. And I really appreciate that. Yeah, skip the tutorial and stuff and just drop you right in. That's really nice. I appreciated that. I didn't try that. I did start over from, from bare bones. But uh, if I start over again, I'll probably do the accelerated start because it is kind of a drag to be like, okay, now I'm mining iron again by hand. Okay. Where does it drop right. you off? Uh, you you basically appear wherever the pod would have landed, but your pockets are full of your first tier of stuff. It If you were to go through and get the first, like, tier of hub stuff done and unlock, like, the miner, the constructor, and the containers, and then you were to tear down everything, <laughs> that's and put it all oh, in your pockets. Oh, I see. The, 
that's what it would be like. Like you've got enough resources in your pockets to build, you know, a couple of miners, a con couple of constructors, the workbenches, the hub, everything. Uh, nice. A little bit of everything. Yeah. So if you reinforce iron plates to get you going. Yes. Yeah, awesome. you've got a few. Yeah, it, it's pretty nice. Those were always the worst to, you know, yes. you've got to like build Make a bunch hand. of screws and then build a bunch of plates and then put them together and you can't automate it until you get to the next tier. So you're just like sitting there, oh, more reinforced iron plates. Right. That that first tier of just making everything by hand is really a chore and you just skip right by that to the base building so that is 100 percent great thing and now i'm torn do i want to like start over again in the desert because i like having room to build and lay out my base at the same time i don't want to start over because you know my my goal is to see the new stuff yeah yeah All you right. should just, well, we'll you see should keep it. going and keep going the starting area doesn't matter that much i don't think i don't know yeah well the rest of this show is all mailbag. Like last week we had like one, and now we've got two, three, four, five. We've got more than three. That's as high as I can count. One, two, three, many. <laughs> okay. Well, that's great. I'm glad we're getting mailbags again. Despite me antagonizing the the audience, and sorry to anybody if I you know left a comment or whatever and like offended you or whatever or I made fun of your comment or your mailbag thing like we're just having, trying to have a good time I don't seriously mean that anybody's stupid or you know I don't like your comments or whatever so it sorry if uh, if I was a little bit too harsh on anybody I appreciate that all right dear diecast although this mostly for shame is sorry Paul dang it since you've been hurting for mailbag questions I'll try to give you some recently I recently sank my teeth into the Tomb Raider reboot 2013 and Rise of Tomb Raider. Okay, the, la the the reboot games. I remember Seamus being really positive about Tomb Raider 2013, but less so about Rise of the Tomb Raider and disliking Shadow. My question is, does Seamus dislike the changes of the latest TR games, or did the reboot Tomb Raider series not sit well over time? Uh, with kind regards, Chris. Yeah, I I was curious about this. In fact, I've been wondering about this for about a year. Like, I've just been feeling like, you know, I don't have fond memories of the Tomb Raider reboot. I remember hmm. that I enjoyed playing it at the time, but I've never had the slightest urge to go back. Is this just... Was that just I was surprised that it wasn't terrible? Or was it really a good game and I've forgotten? So this week, I fired it up and played for a couple hours. And I've got to say, I am not whelmed. I am completely underwhelmed. Uh. Um, it's not bad. There's nothing bad. It's completely inoffensive. And I think the sequels, their, their problem is they've been leaning more and more into the lore and into... The, this backstory and none of it's any good. The, the, in fact, it's <laughs> no. terrible. I mean, it's got so many cutscenes telling a dumb story that doesn't hold together, that doesn't make sense, and it's dissonant, dissonant with the gameplay. And also, I thought the first game was like, okay, now she becomes the superhero. And then you get to the sequel and she's back to being a squealy teenage girl that's scared of everything. And you're like, but I thought... She was a badass <sighs> now, and she keeps being scared, and I keep waiting for her to turn into hyper-competent, you know, Batman, archaeological Batman. That's a, that's what I want, is this, because she's an unstoppable Terminator in gameplay, sure. but, but or, then Or she's, like uh, Indiana Jones or something. Right, exactly. That would have been a better analog. Indiana Jones. But then every time she gets through a gunfight and murders, you know... Her body count ticks up from 512 to 515, and she's like, oh god, oh god, and I'm like, will you get over it, lady? You're done with it. You are okay with murders by now. <laughs> it's not a big deal anymore. And right. so, it, I guess the, flaw, the flaws of the first game have become more pronounced and a bigger part of the experience in the sequels. And so everything that was bad about the first one is worse in the sequels. And everything that 
was good about the first one that it, you know, was a nice reboot with good mechanics. It just sort of stayed flat. Nothing's getting better. And so, yeah, the game doesn't really hold up. That's too bad. I mean, the games were never, like, solid games. No. Right? Like, Tomb Raider has always been just kind of this... It started off as, like, a, you know, a little bit of platforming and a little bit of 3D. It was one of the earlier 3D games, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. It's another game that used renderware. I was so jealous in the mid-90s. My, I was at Active Worlds and we were using renderware. And then I was like, oh, this, this engine seems so limited. And then I play Tomb Raider and I'm like, holy cow, these guys are using the same engine we are. How come our stuff doesn't look this good? <laughs> <laughs> are we are we bad at this? And we kind of were. We kind of were. Oh, well. It's company priorities for you. And and we were trying to do something different. We were, you know, the, the, we were building something where the users create the content. You you can't build right. A yeah, it's a different thing. Doing that. Yeah. And yet, the original Tomb Raider games, the old ones from the '90s, were like platforming, but it's you know not as good as like the Prince of Persia platforming. It's and it's got shooting, but it's not as good as the shooters of the time. It like did, and the puzzles were there. But they weren't as good as the games that were focused on puzzles. So it had a broader, uh, it traded quality for breadth. It had, you know, lots of things from lots of genres, but it wasn't the best at any of them. Uh, I'm glad it existed, but I, f I feel like there's a better game. Oh, there is a better game. It's called Uncharted. Like, Naughty Dog took the idea and made a way better game series. <laughs> right. And then, and then... Tomb Raider itself can't even keep up with that, although it does keep trying. It's kind of like the SimCity thing where City Skylines just kind of made the better SimCity and then... Uh, well, I guess SimCity just died after that, but... Right. Right. SimCity killed itself and then Paradox came in with 12 people and embarrassed everything EA had ever done with the <laughs> license. <laughs> 12 people oh, made City no. Skylines. It's still coming yeah. out with expansions. Oh, it is delicious. Like, every time I see more cities... We have a question about City Skylines in today's show, too. In, in the oh, nice. mailbag, too. So, maybe, maybe we should plow through these for faster. Dear Diecast, You recently praised Risk of Rain 2 for the fact that it allows the player to stack up bonuses without limit and become totally overpowered in the way most games just don't let you. Usually becoming overpowered is boring for the same reason that turning on God Mode is boring. But every now and then I find a game like Noita, I've never figured out how you're sp supposed to pronounce that. N-O-I-T-A. Noita, Noita, whatever it is. Or Slay the Spire, where you becoming way more powerful than the enemy somehow takes makes it fun instead of tedious to spend 15 minutes effortlessly stomping any, everything. What do you think is the magic spark that makes this difference? This is such a good question. 93. Like, 93 is the name of the person that left this, this question. Um, do you have a comment on this before I go off on my, on my long theory, Paul? I don't know. It... That's a, that's a great question. Nothing springs to mind. Like it is really fun in Risk of Rain to to kind of combo off. And uh, the other one I thought of was um, was Magic: The Gathering, where you combo off, right? Where you get this thing working, and then it suddenly all clicks together. I think maybe it has to do with the the mechanics working with each other, as opposed to just your numbers going up. Like in Risk of Rain, you can get upgrades that give you healing when you stand still and then you can get uh, deployable turrets and so you, then the turrets have the auto healing around them and so you put them next to each other and then they heal each other and so there's this puzzle that you're solving in order to become overpowered as opposed to some other games where it's just like well now your numbers are a thousand or ten thousand it's like well okay that's not interesting okay i have a different theory this is to no way suggest that anything you just said is not the case. Because I don't know either. This is just my guess. Um, I've noticed that this same thing, some games it feels really good to break them. Um, and for the most part, I like the feeling that you're getting away with something. The feeling that you're subverting the game. 
like a, in the original Fallout, I found a really good build. Oh, if you do this and you, you start the game with super high agility, and then if you go, there's somebody that can give you a surgery to give you another point of agility. And then there's Even another... more agility. Right, so you max out your agility, but you also have points in intelligence, and you've got just enough in charisma. And then there's this, then there's this perk you can take in the mid-game that will make all... Firing all weapons take one less action point. And then you can go talk to these guys um, in a place called the Boneyard. And if you've got a plasma rifle, then they'll overcharge it. One of them will overcharge it. So it takes one less, um, you know, action point. Basically, I figured out how to fire the plasma rifle four times in a turn. When normally it just... <laughs> if you, if when you build your character normally you can fire it once in a turn or maybe if you've got a really high agility character twice but I found this combination that let me fire four times a turn and it was amazing it was just it just you could feel how broken it is you get ganked by an entire mob of super mutants and you can kill them all before they get a shot off and it just feels so cool um, but you feel like you found this secret path through the mechanics. It isn't just like, oh, once you hit level 25, then automatically you'll be able to do this and the game gets easy. I feel like I unlocked this secret. I earned it. And then it doesn't feel like boring. It doesn't feel patronizing. And it, you don't get bored because you feel like you're getting away with something and that this is your reward for being clever. Even if, you know, thousands of other people you know, did the same research and, you know, came up with the same build. And I'm sure there's people with even better builds out there. Somebody will tell me, no, 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 no. If you do this, then you'll become overpowered in melee and you'll kill people even faster. But sure. But it felt like a challenge that you were solving a, a, a trick that you had pulled off as opposed to just, I played this game for a hundred hours and now I can win. Yeah. I also like the feeling of trading short-term hardship for long-term reward in Bethesda's games. There'd be there was some there was something about I forget in Scar in Skyrim there was something about starting a game as a stealth character that was just a huge pain in the ass. But if you put enough if you spend enough time sneaking and you're patient enough, you max out your sneak skill. And you can do just ridiculous amounts of damage. <laughs> um, oh, the other thing you do is you very carefully make sure you don't level up anything else. It's really complicated. When you level up other things, they gradually raise your character level. Like if I got 100 levels of just, you know, screwing around, I got a 100 levels of, of alchemy, but I don't make any potions, right? then those 100 levels of alchemy are dra have dragged my character up to like level 30 or something but my skills the ones that i use to fight are you know where they would be if i was a level 20 character so all the ba because of bethesda's stupid auto leveling all the bad guys have grown relatively in power and i have grown less because i've diversified my skills too much it's it's a stupid and broken system and nobody thought about it. But if you do the opposite, where you make sure to be very careful to like, there's books you'll find around the world. You just pick it up and oh, instantly you got a level of heavy armor. It's like, I'll never use heavy armor. That skill point I just got leveled me up a tiny bit without giving, making me any stronger. If you, if you see what I'm saying. So yeah, it's not improving your ability to, to operate in the world. It's just making you, higher number level so that the enemies get harder exactly so if you do the opposite and you know if most players just run around they don't care about the skill points together if you deliberately avoid all skill points except for the ones that are related directly to your combat skills then you'll stay really low level throughout the game and you know i always get like my leveling would stall at like level 15 or something but i'm just murdering everything in my path because and again it feels like i figured something out and i've figured out the secret of the game and my reward is 
being able to kill everything in one hit from perfect safety and they'll never find me. Um, yes. Um, yeah, I, I like it, but it has to feel earned. And I like the feeling, either earned by being clever and making a clever build, or earned in the sense that I went through a more difficult early game to have the more power, the, in Fallout 4, you know, save all your skill points, don't spend them right away. Save them until you get things that have synergy. And okay, that makes the slog getting up to like your mid-teens really slow and dangerous. But once you get a few of these powers, and you've got a bunch of skill points you can put into them, you're much stronger than you would otherwise be at that level. Right. So I enjoy both of those. Either rewarding you for patience or cleverness. And yeah, I, I think that's why it's fun and not boring is because it feels like a reward and not just like every... Oh, excuse me. Not like everybody gets this. There we go. Dear Diecast Seamus. Sorry, Paul. Oh, that's the second time this week they've done this to us. Any update on whether the forums are coming back? Oh. oh, I forgot about this one. Yeah, okay, this is a totally legit question. I should answer this. Since this is a question kind of site-wide, I should not answer this just on the podcast since there's a lot of people that don't listen to the podcast. Basically, I like the forums too. The forums got infected with spam bots or malware, and I just took it down. Um, I liked having them there. Some people really liked it as a place to hang out. And I was thinking maybe instead of doing that, I could fire up a Discord server and everybody could hang out. But do I have enough time to take care of that? And I'm not sure what's involved in taking care of a Discord server. So, so th this is something I need to research. I'm working on it. I'll see what I can do. Thank you, Retsum. Dear Diecast, I've been watching the release of GeForce Now with interest, but it seems that the service is faltering somewhat. Given that publishers are removing or withholding their games from the service. However, I'm a bit confused as to why this is an issue or why there are even compatible games for this service. GeForce Now appears to effectively be a virtualized OS instance. I've checked several EULAs from various publishers and none of them prohibit the use of games on a virtual machine. They prohibit third-party software that alters the game experience, reselling software, etc. So on what basis is this removal even taking place under? Maybe you have some insight into this or maybe it'll spark a debate in the comments. All the best. Do oh, it's the Valman. We meet again, Dr. Val. Um, <laughs> the name is spelled... For those of you that don't read the show notes, this name is spelled D-U-O-A-E. You are just short of having all the vowels in your name next to each other. All right. And it is unpronounceable. It cannot be pronounced. I think I usually pronounce it Duo-A. Yeah. All right, so when I... Sounds familiar. Okay, GeForce Now was one of the things I remember hearing about, I believe it was at E3. And at E3, instead of checking out this, I checked out several others. There's all, everybody is coming out with their own gaming services, right? Google had Stadia. Um, Microsoft has uh, their Xbox PC crossover service i forget what it was called <laughs> um discord has one twitch has one everybody everybody's got these where you either it's either like the google stadia model where it runs on our machines and we stream the footage to you or you just pay a monthly subscription and you have access to a bunch of games sure. um this this is the this is the former. This is a Google Stadia competitor. And I find this really confusing. I'm surprised that it's out. I forgot it existed. And I forgot which kind of service it was. I had to go check the homepage just now to make sure what it was. But yes, it, it talks about, you know, you need such and such internet connection to stream, you know, 720p footage or whatever. So it's, it's definitely a competitor to Google Stadia except it works. So when we get back to this <laughs> except so when we get to back to this question the question is it used to be this is an interesting this is an interesting 
service. This is different than Google Stadia. Google Stadia, you have to pay this, them a subscription, but then you also have to buy a copy of the game to run on their... You have to get the Google Stadia version of the latest Assassin's Creed, even if you've already bought the Assassin's Creed on another platform. And if Google Stadia vanishes, that copy that you bought is lost. And on Google Stadia, you buy it for launch day prices, even if it's a two-year-old game. So it was a terrible deal. Right. Uh, GeForce Now is much better. It's your, like, you give it your Steam login, which, who doesn't want to type their Steam credentials into the internet? <laughs> so that another oh boy. company... <laughs> um, so that you can... Th and then their servers log in to your account, and then you're playing your game on your account, but on their server, and they're streaming the footage to you. But now, Interesting. But now some companies are saying, hey, you're not allowed to have our game on your service. Now, this is just what I've been able to figure out based on this email. Like, oh, we don't, I don't know what games are the games affected, but they've been pulling their games. And yeah, my question is all is the same as Duo A's. Wait, how can you do, under what basis can you demand if, if you have a complaint, it, it's like me sharing, if I share my Steam credentials with you, Paul, nobody can stop you from using it. Like, right. If I let, if I give you my Steam credentials and you log in as me and begin playing my copy of Shadow of the Tomb Raider, because it's an awesome game and you should totally play it. I love it. No, really. The best game ever. Yeah. <laughs> right. And you begin playing that. Now, I could understand if Valve has a problem, but Crystal Dynamics or Sony have nothing to say about this. I don't understand what the basis of this is, or if there's something going on here. Unless it's in the EULA, it's some sort of technical thing where it, they can't stop each individual person from doing it. But if there's one central guy, they can be like, oh, well, we're going to sue you for doing this unless you take our games off the site. Right. Oh, you know, this is a non-transferable license, so therefore they're technically transferring it to you so you can run the game on your server. Yeah, that would something be, like that. That would be, yeah, I can kind of see that. That's that's a good angle. Maybe that's what's happening. It's obnoxious because it's, and I mean, if you're trying to kill the the Google Stadia model, then you're that's the right way to do it, <laughs> game companies. <laughs> like, I that would definitely kill Google Stadia-like services. And since I hate the idea of these services, uh, this seems like, I mean, it's obnoxious corporate chicanery or is it chicanery i always get conflicting uh <laughs> answers when i ask either way shenanigans we'll use the word shenanigans it's it's awful rules lawyering shenanigans between giant corporations trying to screw each other at the expense of the consumer so i don't really have a horse in this race but if it if it forestalls the arri the arrival of games are being streamed all the time, then I'm fine with it. It would be nice if the lawyers lost one of these things, but that doesn't seem to be happening. Right, and the lawyers are on both sides, so I'm not sure how that can happen. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. That's kind of like going into a football game. Oh, who are you? Who are you cheering for? Well, I hope the refs lose. <laughs> I hope all the cheerleaders lose. <laughs> it's like, I don't think this is going to go your way, buddy. All right. Dear Diecast, not too long ago I encountered this video. I will have a link to this video in the comments, in the show notes. It makes the argument that Half-Life 2 is a bad sequel, though not necessarily a bad game. Now, I've never played any of the Half-Life games, um, so I can't make a properly informed assessment of the argument. But something struck me about it. One of the points he makes is that Half-Life 2 throws away most of the interesting and unique story elements of 1 in favor of a safer and more cliched story. In particular, the game dis discards the original sequel hooks by introducing a new antagonist faction, which comes out of nowhere, takes over the world, and is suddenly the most important thing over. This is suddenly, this sounds very familiar. 
So I wanted to see what you think of it, given your fondness for the game. What's your reaction to seeing someone make criticisms of it so similar to the ones you leveled at Mass Effect 2? Um, do you think they're reasonable arguments? Blah, blah, blah. Um, Kestrelius. Wait, Kestrelius, wasn't that the bad guy in the Doctor Strange movie? I didn't the watch guy it. With the, the guy with the purple eyes? I don't know. Somebody tell me in the comments, because I'm too lazy to look it up. P.S. I don't know if you'll like the first video I linked by that guy, but you'll definitely like this one. And I watched that one, and it's he starts off trying to make the case that inverted controls, the way I do it, where pressing forward on the mouse looks down, is the only correct way to do it. Uh, <laughs> oh. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's that seems to be this guy's brand is just like, this is correct, and if you disagree, then you're wrong. And it, I mean, he also sounds incredibly young. I think he talked about playing Half-Life 2, well, maybe he talked about playing it as a kid, as a teenager, so he's not that young. But, you know, I was in my 30s when I played, <laughs> when I played it, so, yeah, we're definitely a generation apart. Um... Taking the second one, even I disagree with the idea that inverted mouse, like that inverted mouse is the only correct way to do it. Because if you put a random human being down at a computer and you put the mouse in their hand, they are going to assume that pushing the mouse forward looks up. That's what people assume. And so that's the correct way to do it. Even though I do it the other way, because I started on flight sims and built up muscle memory with that. But, you know, the correct way is whatever is most intuitive for the user. You know, users don't exist for the interface. The interface exists for the user. So, right. you can't argue that everyone is wrong when it comes to user interfaces. Even if everybody makes the same mistake. Everybody makes a dumb mistake and there's it's explained right there on the screen. There's a tooltip telling you what to do and they press the wrong button anyway. If everybody makes that mistake, then it's still the interface's fault. Because the interface needs to draw your attention to it or make it clear. Right. It has to it has to be the job of the person writing the software to do a good job writing the software. You can't say like, oh well, they made it the best way, which happens to be a way that no one can use. It's like, that this doesn't make any sense. Right. It's like doors. When you're supposed to pull a door, the handle is vertical. So you grab onto it with your hand. And when it's a push door, the handle is horizontal. So you press on it with both your hands and walk through. If you mix that up, so it's a push door with a vertical handle, but then you hang up a that's backwards from everybody will look at the handle assume they know what they're doing and then they'll try and pull on it and it won't open and then and then you hang up a sign that you know says push that doesn't fix the problem people don't read the sign <laughs> they do with their muscle memory we don't go around reading every bullshit sign we see we're you know we're often busy thinking about other things um, with other problems. And when you have this pattern that's been built up over the course of your life, you, s I mean, that's what we do. That's why we're not paralyzed all the time processing the, the exabytes of redundant information in the world around us is we notice patterns that we take advantage of that by following the pattern. And if you break with the pattern, putting up a sign that says, warning, pattern is different, doesn't get you out of the fact that you built a shitty interface to begin with. That was a long digression, I apologize. Um, so, uh, to his main points, talking about Half-Life 2, the difference between, for me, Half-Life, what I know this is obnoxious, Half-Life, I didn't really care about the story. It was the, that feeling of gameplay, that feeling of being pulled through an environment, having interesting things to do, of creating an atmosphere, I didn't really care who the enemy was. Oh, the aliens attacked, and they made a bunch of human mooks. That's fine. That full, that replaces mechanically the human mooks you fought in the first game. That's fine. It doesn't need to be. This isn't. This isn't details first sci-fi. This is. This isn't even drama first. It's gameplay first, and I believe the the game was very clear about that. Drama first, mood second, and then keeping its lore straight was you know way 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 down the list in priorities. Right. 
Right, and meanwhile, Mass Effect was, you know, I can't, we're here for the characters in the story, first and foremost. It doesn't matter, oh, you, you know, you, you mess around with the gameplay and it's more focused on biotic powers now, fine, whatever. Just, you know, get the characters right and the lore right. All right, I promised you earlier that there was more talk about city skylines, and here we are. Sup Dicastermans. I was recently disappointed by City Skylines. Well, maybe by one of their level designers. I love the game and I recently started my yearly-ish city building project. I selected a map that had a lovely canyon in which I hoped to build a hydroelectric dam. I got this far in the email and I knew exactly what this was about. Oh no. This dam wasn't going to win any awards for the highest dam in the game, but it was good enough. I built my population, saved my money, and built the dam. It wasn't the des best dam, but it was ours. Uh, the, this person links to images of their dam. I think it looks pretty cool. I will have them in the show notes. That, and it was going to double my electricity production, but it was all a lie. It turns out the lovely canyon was just a sculpture. The riverbed at its bottom was nothing but a carved sluice. As soon as the river broke its bank, filling stopped for good. I even tried to augment the flow of the river by dirt, diverting my mostly filtered sewage into it. Okay, so what they're saying is the, uh, the rivers in this game cheat. You can't... I've had this same problem. You see a canyon, and then way at the bottom of the canyon is a tiny river. In real life, you put a dam across there, and the wild water will continue to pile up behind that dam until it's the height of the dam. And the game will even tell you, oh, this is going to be a really good dam. Oh, it's you know, it'll assume that's what's going to happen. But the river is actually hard-coded to not go above the riverbank. Somehow. And so, it won't even have enough head to generate any electricity. Ah. Um, getting to the end of this, I've always enjoyed the way City Skyline simulates realistic water flow and lets you build dams based on actual hydrostatic pressure, but the map designed on this one foiled the system and left me sad. Um, and then basically, what do you think of this? Um, kind regards... Toticus. So yeah, I've I don't know that it's just that map. Either you and I tried the exact same map and got the same results, or this is just a problem with their end. There's a bunch of rampant cheating going on behind the scenes in City Skylines. I've had the same thing, and you'll see it when you're making a dam. You'll get a big dam. You'll stretch across a really wide river. And you'll see it sort of fluctuates between, oh, this is going to generate 100 megawatts. Oh, wait, zero. Oh, wait, five. Oh, wait, 90. 92. 95. Three. And it's like you're holding the mouse, you know, basically, you take your hand off the mouse and it'll continue to do this. Or moving it by just microns and it'll give you wildly divergent a answers. And it's really odd because the game simulates the flow of water. You know, you can pile up stuff behind a dam, then delete the dam, and the water will actually, you know... Well, the, if you block a river, the, the water will back up, flood nearby areas, wash, you know, back up so much it washes out a bridge. But then sometimes it doesn't do it, and I've never figured out why. And yeah, it's super annoying because it feels like they went to all the work of simulating the flow of water... And then they put in a cheat somewhere that sort of negated all that simu simulation. And, and I've always been confused about why they did that, since it leads to very confusing results. The question here is, what games or circumstances have left you similarly disappointed? That was a long way to ask what games ultimately disappointed you <laughs> when you hoped that they were going like to do Promising more something promising some sort yeah. of deep simulation and then just being like nope actually it doesn't exist i mean that's a super broad question you could spend we could spend months on that one i mean no man's sky <laughs> oh. every single system in no man's sky is exactly that oh what's this simu oh nothing it's dumb it doesn't do anything it's pointless paul have you ever been disappointed by a simulation that turned out to be a sham I'm sure lots of times, like nothing comes to me off the top of my head, but um, 
yeah, the, it seems like games like to cheat a lot, and that's just kind of that's just kind of what happens, I guess. I mean, it is hard to make a real deep simulation, but. Uh, it right. would be nice if it didn't look like a deep simulation when it really wasn't. Right, right. A, a, a game sort of... It's one thing if it's just this big dumb abstraction. You're like, okay, it's an abstraction. But then they make it look like a simulation and you trust that and then it disappoints you. Exactly. Um, yeah, I, I can't think of any other examples. Oh! That we can tie this back to Rise of the Tomb Raider. You start off, with, or not Rise of the Tomb Raider, just Tomb Raider 2013. At the beginning of the game, you have to like kill a deer for food, build a fire to keep warm, and I'm like, holy cow, this is hardcore survival. This game's taking it really seriously. But that's the last time you have to eat or rest in the entire game. Like the game makes such a big deal of how it doesn't exist. It's just like right. it's just this mood piece. Right, and but the game makes you go out and do all this stuff, and Laura is so cold and so tired and so hungry, and she has this desperate, like, this is this Jack London experience. And then once she's fed, she's like, well, never need to do any of that again. And you're like, I, <laughs> it feels a little weird. It fe You know what? If it had been in the middle of the game, you would have understood it was, it was a mood. Okay, she's been weakened by the adventure, and she needs to nurse herself back to health. But... It introduces all these mechanics at the beginning of the game and that sort of telegraphs to you that this is what the game is about and then it turns out to not be the case and it feels weird it feels like if doom began the game with you having to clean a gun and put gun oil in it and make sure all the car cartridges are clean and all your, you know, it simulates emptying several magazines, several partially emptied magazines and putting the bullets into one full one. And you're like, whoa, this is going to be like receiver. It's like this gun simulator. And then you get in there and it's just a plasma rifle that has infinite bullets. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> and you're like, what up? What's all that stuff about bullet simulate? That's what it felt like. Like it felt like it promised one thing and then went for something much simpler without explanation. All right, dear Diecast, there was a recent interview with now ex-Bioware writer Drew Karpishan, I hope I didn't just butcher his name, I've butchered his name so many times, where he lamented that the studio became more corporate as it got larger, which affected the game design. How does this fit into your thoughts on the games and acquisition by EA? All the best, duo A. Will we meet again, Dr. Val. So, another question for me. I feel like I've been talking a lot this one. Even I know I usually talk nah, more than you. Normal. Yeah, but it feels like this is even more. So, I'm not... I'm going to tip my hand here, Paul. For years, I've been pretending... You know, I've. you remember in my Mass Effect series, I was always like, the writer. I always referred to the entire writing staff as one person. Right, it's easier that way. Right, and I didn't want it to feel like I was singling anybody out. Like, oh, Bob Reiterman, he's the one that broke Mass Effect. He's the jerk. Like, I didn't want this to be personal. Um, but secretly, in my heart of hearts, I always assumed that Drew Karpishin was the good guy at was the person making the stuff that I liked. I shouldn't say he's the good writer. He's the one that was on my wavelength. Hmm. He made the... Just looking at the stories he's written, he, he, he's like me. He, he's got a few themes he loves to hit. And, you know, he wants to just take this set of ideas and play around with it in different genres. Like, that's kind of what he's done over the years. There was a lot of similarity between, like, KOTOR, which I believe he, he was writer on KOTOR, Jade Empire, and Mass Effect 1. I, I should look it up before I run my mouth, just in case I make a fool of myself, but going from memory, I think he was on all three, and you can really see the similarities between those two games, those three games. And his exit, or his, he kept stepping away from... Um, 
further and further from Mass Effect. He was only he was only involved with parts of Mass Effect 2 and parts of a Mass Effect 2 were good. <laughs> and he was he was barely involved with Mass Effect 3 and yeah, Mass Effect 3 was Mass Effect 3. And he mm, did he yeah. he never got within he he never got within 100 miles of of Mass Effect Andromeda and that game was just terrible. Everything was terrible except the game right. was okay. So, you can kind of now I I'm I I don't want to say that the other writers were terrible, but I want to kind of imply that he was the voice of Bioware that most of us love. So when he talks about how the corporatization of Bioware made him want to leave, I do kind of want to tie that to EA. All right. EA created a situation where their best talent left. Where the talent that made the company what it was left. Now, we can't prove it from the outside, but that's, and you could, you could come up with other explanations, but that explanation fits for me. And again, that has to be, that has to be a negative, you have to lay the blame for that on EA. Like, that's part of your job, that's part of your due diligence as a, a corporate entity. If you pay millions of dollars, hundreds of millions, tens of millions of dollars for a company. It's up to you to make sure that you get what you paid for. If you create a situation, and this is just classic, EA, you know, this is the pattern that EA has. They want to treat, when they buy out a developer, they want to treat them as a black box. We pour money into the black box and a game will come out the other side. And they've never None of their leaders have ever demonstrated any understanding that game developers are not interchangeable. And if you do, if you lose a bunch of your top talent, your games will suffer in quality. Like, they don't even seem to be aware that there is such a thing as talented and not talented personnel. Yeah. Uh, this story was huge this week. And I, everybody, all the YouTube channels I follow talked about it. It's, I, I am a little wary of jumping on this bandwagon because everybody is coming to the same conclusion I did. Yeah, like, oh, see, this means EA ruined everything. And I realize that's sort of like, that's the most attractive thing to say as someone on the outside is blaming yeah, EA. Yeah, it's easy. It's easy and it fits our preconceived notions. On the other hand, I, you know, even playing, even playing devil's advocate, I just, you know, this, it became less fun to work there, and the most talented people left. <laughs> and this seems like something that EA, if the people at the top, if even like a few of the people at the top understood game development and what it was like to work in the trenches, if they understood video games the way, say, Walt Disney understood cinema, then there would be no problem. They would know how to retain talent. They would know how to tell the difference between good and bad products. Yeah, you can't just be a manager of companies. You have to be a manager of a certain kind of company because companies aren't fungible. Right, right. And companies aren't black boxes. You don't just pour money in and get a game of, of the other side. There's technology problems, people problems, IP problems, throughput problems, changing technology problems. And EA has, the EA leadership doesn't seem to understand any of that. The frostbite engine debacle makes it look like they don't understand the tech end of it. The way they treat their employees makes it look like they don't understand basic business. And that if you treat your employees really shitty, then the first people to to leave will be the most talented and the last people to leave will be the ones that have the hardest time getting a job elsewhere so you're creating a reverse filter to keep the losers and filter out the awesome people so they can go work for your competition are you an idiot yeah but but there's so much cheaper Seamus I mean like right? <laughs> we're paying these guys nothing right and yeah that so they don't seem to understand personnel management they don't seem to understand that different studios have different things that they'll be good at they don't understand why you can't just have bioware make you you know 
a bro shooter. Oh, but bro shooters are really, really, you know, pop more popular than RPGs. Yeah, but you can't just throw a switch and and have this team make a completely different genre of game and expect it to come out right. And so they don't seem to understand games, genres, technology, people, or or management. And I'm like, how <laughs> terrible are these people? And I kind of feel like if you're getting paid $14 million a year, you owe the shareholders more than being bad at everything. <laughs> it's just like, yeah. their, their plan to make more money is to like, well, FIFA made money because we put a slot machine in it. So let's put slot machines in everything. That's like the Dorito. <laughs> That's like a food company going, oh, you know, spam. Habanero cheese Doritos are selling great. Yeah, yeah, that's a popular product. So here's what we're doing. We're putting habanero cheese in everything. Our yogurt, breakfast cereals, everything. Or candy. Have, just put habanero cheese dust in everything. Because it made money in this one context. Like, that's how stupid EA's behavior looks from the outside. And it's not like they... They can't make good games. Like, they do. EA makes good games. But... You're right. There's, like, games and games, and there are different genres inside the inside the industry, and you can't... It seems like, like you said, they can't distinguish between high and low quality games, between high and low quality developers, and between high and low quality companies. And it's like, well... That's your entire job as a conglomerate is to distinguish between <laughs> high and low quality things so that, right. so that you can acquire the high quality things. Uh, right? And so when a good game like Jedi Fallen Order comes out, it doesn't feel like, see, EA knows how to make good games. It feels like, well, something good sometimes sneaks through their reverse filter, their reverse quality filter. Some, sometimes they accidentally set, let something good through. <laughs> Like, my first fear with Jedi Fallen Order is that the next one's going to be infested with loot boxes because this one sold right. The best thing you can be is unnoticed. Oh, you're not selling well? Then we don't care what you do. Just do whatever. Oh, you're uh, popular? Right. <laughs> well, then we have some things we want you. Okay, you're gonna you're making these Jedi games. Well, you need online multiplayer with unlockable loot boxes. You'll need a cash shop. <laughs> and it's like... But that doesn't fit in this game. Prove me wrong, EA. I dare you to to make another Jedi Fallen Order, you know, Jedi game, and not screw it up. I dare you. That's gonna be a tough sell. We're running long. All right. Um, let's let's plow through this very last question. Dear Diecast, in the past, both of you have spoken about ballooning game install sizes and procedurally generated content. Now it seems like there's more tech on the horizon for reducing not only install size, but also development work. On one hand, a team at Microsoft are working on using machine learning to up-res textures on the fly. On the other, Dreams, uh, from Media Molecule, I'm not familiar with this, uses some sort of real-time renderer that utilizes async computabilities of the APU in the PlayStations. Both of these techniques mean, that mean small install sizes, and interesting optimizations and could be an interesting addition for procedural generation. Further to this, we already have the nascent ray tracing technology. I think the next few years will be really interesting. And there's a link to a YouTube video, which I will link in the show notes below. What do you think? All the best, do away. Um, so, Paul, you use Blender a lot. I do. I, I know the Blender texture, like you can build your own material. They're not just textures, they're materials. And I yeah, know you correct, can, yeah. yeah, it has some sort of con concept of detail textures. That's what they're called in video games. I don't know what Blender calls them, but it's like you can blend two textures together so that like yeah. we've got like at a distance, it has this giant blurry texture of bricks. But the closer I get, the more it'll add in this other texture, which at a distance would be super repetitive. It would be really tiled, really hard. But, you know, it only fades into view when you get close, and it adds a bunch of fine detail. And this was really popular, uh, I want to say mid-aughts, is, is when I noticed it 
the most. I, you know, I'm, I didn't work at any of the big studios, so I don't know when it was really it. But that's when I noticed it creeping into the tools. Sometime between 2000 and the aughts. And given that that exists, why would anybody want machine learning to up res a texture when you could use a detail texture and it would ha give you the same result? Yeah. It, I, I don't know what portion of a game... You might be able to speak to this a little more in detail, but I don't know what portion of a game is the texture size. But it seems like it can't be that much. I don't know. Uh, te textures and audio, depending on the game, either audio or textures is the biggest. Te textures are huge. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Te okay. Textures are huge. Like, 3D models are not much. Because we kind of leveled off like 10 years ago, I think Polygon counts just leveled off. And, or maybe they've been going up slightly. But, you know, for a few years there, especially going from the 90s to the early aughts, it was like they were going up with Moore's Law. So, like, they would double every 18 months. It was really a big deal. And then once you got around, I forget, a few thousand polygons for your typical humanoid. And with the exception of, like, f um, humanoids that appear in cutscenes and get close-up shots, those will have way, way more. But just your your general mooks that you plow down, they're only a couple thousand, you know, a few thousand. Less than 10,000 polygons, all the ones I've seen. Maybe okay. I haven't been keeping up enough. And that sound, I know that sounds low, but every once in a while I'll see one without the texture in wireframe mode, and it looks like, yeah... Sub 10k polygons, often way less than sub, you know, 10k polygons. So models have not been getting that much bigger, but textures keep getting bigger, and audio, especially the games that have a lot of audio and they don't compress it, they're uncompressed. What is it? Flak files. It's just yeah, like wow. those things are enormous. Um, then they yeah, get really big. High quality audio has got to be gargantuan. But it seems like they'd be compressing all that stuff. Maybe they don't. Maybe that's why they're so huge. Maybe they're trying to cut... Maybe they're trading um, hard drive space for s better load times. Because if you've got to uncompress yeah, the audio, true. then 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 that's extra time. And to be honest, I would gl I'd gladly take that deal. Assuming that's why, I will gladly take, you know, anything to speed up load times. Double the install size. I'll buy I'll buy more hard drives. Just don't make me right. sit in any more loading screens, please. So, um, so from that perspective, it sounds like this neural network thing is basically just another way of compressing data. Because if you're right having a low quality image on one side and then you put it through this thing and it creates a high quality image out, it's like, how is that different from compression? Unless it's right. some sort of way to like make novel textures so that you can have a whole bunch of different textures from one base texture. It seems like a terrible idea to me because it takes so much power out of the hands of the artists that, you know, oh, you just put your low res texture in and it'll make it better. And they'll be like, but is it going to be what I want? Does it fit with what I'm <laughs> better trying to how? do? Yeah, is it just got more pixels? What do those pixels look like? And, you know, if an artist is, you know, you've got some engraved brick wall or some engraved stone wall well the texture up reser isn't going to add engraving that isn't there it's not going to make some right some detailed pattern some detailed card pattern or like intuit what the all it's going to do is add more little dents and cracks you know like typical bricks and Seems it's going to be like, compute yeah. yeah and it would just be really compute heavy like that would that's the problem they're that's the problem they're trying to solve is is loading times and this would slow down loading times if you've got to run every texture so I, okay i suppose you could download a small game and then run this neural network on it and it would blow up you know i download 5 gigabytes of day, of game it blows it runs through this processor and becomes 30 gigabytes of game. That would help people on metered connection, but it would also make install times take ridiculously long. Again, that 
that's more waiting for the user, that's less convenience for the user. That doesn't make sense to me. That's not what people want. Even Dwarf Fortress, that is very low resolution, uh, takes a long time to procedurally generate stuff. And at a certain point, yeah. as much as I love procedural generation, at a certain point there's a trade-off where it's like, you got to process some of this stuff in advance so that you're not sitting there waiting for it to, you know, boot up your game or start your file or whatever. Right. And the longer and the more detail you add, the less you're getting out. You know, you're doubling the amount of detail, but you're quadrupling the amount of processor it takes to get you there. It seems like just throwing a detail texture over it would solve this problem for a fraction of the cost all around. It would be smaller download and smaller load times, and it would just be better. I mean, if you're going to take the power of creativity out of the artist's hands anyway, just throw some sort of generic cracks and dense detail texture over everything, over your blurry, big texture, and there, you're done. So, yeah, this makes no sense to me. It seems like it's saving you on the one thing you don't care about, which is hard drive space, in order to, in order to make things take longer which is the one thing people really care. In fact, that's, you know, that's the big selling point of all these other services is like, no waiting, just start up your game, and it starts instantly. Right. You don't want to have to sit around waiting for your neural network to try to figure out what the texture should look like. I mean, personally, I just, you know, turn texture filtering to linear and leave everything pixelated. That's my jam. But I guess that's not popular. You know, Minecraft level textures, I'm down <laughs> with it. Yeah. 16 pixels per meter? Okay. Let's do it. Let's totally do it. Yeah. You your entire AAA game will download in five minutes. Take like no bandwidth. Load times will be a matter of seconds. Let's do it. Well, that's the good graphics argument again, right? I guess so. I guess so. And we've done that a few times, haven't we? Well, thanks to everybody. We got through them all, Paul. We got through all the questions. We did it! Again! That's great! Thanks to everyone who sent in questions. If you have a question for the show, the email is diecast at shamusyoung.com. Thanks for listening, everybody. Say goodbye, Paul. Goodbye! is a machine learning algorithm that could generate this show. Actually, you wouldn't even need machine learning. You just need like a random number generator of like complaining about Mass Effect, or complaining about graphics, and maybe complaining about EA. Yeah, that's what I was going to say, complaining about EA. Perfect. We don't even have to do the show anymore. We could just chop this up and use a, a Markov chain generator and we, we're done. Maybe throw occasional praise for satisfactory in there just to keep things fresh. Ha <laughs> ha!